Thank you so much. Um, it's good to see so much good energy. You must have had coffee this morning already. <laughs> uh, usually it's that first part of the morning and everyone's good. And then it's like after lunch, everyone starts to come down. We'll talk about that. But I always want to thank everybody first and foremost whenever they're anywhere. I think this is mandatory, but I'm still going to thank you. <laughs> um, and I always want to make sure that I'm giving as much nuggets, as many nuggets of wisdom as possible for your time because time is so valuable to all of us and time is our most precious asset that we have. And um, so much of what I'm going to talk about today is going to hopefully impact your time for days coming forward, months and years, um, so that you get the most out of your time, the most productivity, the most en um, energy, mental clarity, and what it comes down to, too, is passion and happiness. So um, that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Health and wellness is something that's really um, a top priority and passion to me, and um, it's something that I feel I can't be a serial entrepreneur without. Um, I need every ounce of energy I have. Um, and then the rest of that, or the majority of that other energy goes to my eight-year-old twin daughter. So um, every moment matters. And um, so I'm excited to share this information with you. As George said, I am a serial entrepreneur. My first business... Um, actually it was here in Wilmington, Delaware. It was right down the road um, in the Deladon building. And I was a national level fitness competitor. I owned a gym. And um, I also trained trainers and instructors all over the world. So it was a really exciting time period for me. But I believe that my real entrepreneurial lifestyle began when I was in first grade. And I didn't realize it then, but now I do looking back, that when Sister Elizabeth tied me to my chair in first grade, she didn't realize I was perfecting my networking skills. And she didn't realize what a valuable network, how valuable networking is to all of our success. So um, I look back at that time period and I realized that my energy was high and um, Sister Elizabeth didn't get it. But I channeled that energy and serious ADD into the fitness career. When I was in college, I had studied education. My dad was the belief that you get a degree and then you do whatever that is that you got your degree in. Where I had a different plan. I was getting that degree at the time because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So quickly to appease my father after college, I became a teacher, um, a kindergarten teacher. And um, I knew that it wasn't something I wanted to do in that sense. Um, but to appease my father, I did, and I quickly, um, within six months after I took over for somebody who was leaving for um, maternity leave, I was teaching kindergarten, and I realized and validated that that is exactly what I did not want to do. And God bless the people that had the patience to do that. But throughout high school um, and, and earlier years, I was an athlete. I played soccer and basketball and, and track, and, and in college... Um, I wasn't playing those sports, but I was still wanting to be active, and step aerobics became the hot thing on the scene. And so I went home for Christmas vacation, and I did it. I had done a step class in a local gym, and I was like, this is so much fun. I'm like dancing. I don't even feel like I'm working out. So I went back to college after that semester break, and I was like, we need to get steps. So they supplied some steps. I had my big boom box, my cassette tape, and I began it teaching in a gym with the worst acoustics in the world and no microphone. So that's where my journey in health and wellness and fitness, structured fitness, began. So after I validated for my father that teaching in the traditional sense of teaching was not what I wanted to do, I said to him, I'm going to go into fitness. Well, fitness still really wasn't especially in his mind, a career path. And so I began this career path in doing various things. I had no idea what I was doing. None. All I knew is I was doing what I was passionate about. And so as I began teaching at all these different fitness facilities all over in New York and in Philly, I wound up getting a place right down the street here in the Deladon building and um, became a national level competitor. So it was an amazing life, and I, many moments, would stop and be like, wait a second, I'm getting paid for this? I love this. I can't even imagine someone's paying me to do this. And that, to me, set me on a trajectory of life and a belief system of life, that we should be doing things that we love. We should be living out our passion. We should be identifying what we're good at 
and giving that excitement for what we're good at to other people. And so that began my journey as an entrepreneur because I knew that that is what I love doing. And I couldn't go and do anything else that I wasn't happy doing because I knew what that felt like. That six months before, I knew exactly what it felt like. I would drive to school and be like, oh, what could I do to be late today? What could I do to... <laughs> Maybe if it was just a little fender bender. And then you're wishing like ill will on yourself. That is a big sign that you're not doing the right thing. But in my journey as a fitness competitor and running a gym and living a life that I absolutely loved and adored, I thought I was superwoman. And at 26 years of age, my kidneys, liver, and heart started to shut down from overtraining and overworking and not resting. And the lactic acid started to build up in my system so much that it started to attack my organs and my body. And I didn't have a plan B. I had no plan B. I thought I was going to be doing that till at least, oh gosh, if I was 40. I thought that was like going to be far away at the time. I just turned 39 two weeks ago. <laughs> but it seemed like my, my life, my future was ahead of me in that world and in that space and all these goals I had. And sometimes life has a way of showing up and getting you back onto the right path. And why I say that is, during that time period, I started with the right intention and purpose. I loved what I was doing. And I loved what I was doing because I loved inspiring other people and motivating other people to want more for themselves than they knew that they wanted for themselves. And I like to push people out of their comfort zone. And I like to push people to set their goals higher than they gave themselves value of their own self-worth for. And that's why I got into that industry and that's why I was doing what I was doing but I lost sight of that and losing sight of that I started to judge myself by my body fat content by the weight on the scale and the size of my clothes and that is completely the wrong way to be judging yourself I was judging myself in a very superficial one-dimensional way and I completely lost sight of my purpose and I believe that when that happens often life keeps showing up with a lot of red flags for you but we often don't pay attention to them. It's just like, it's kind of life circumstance, right? It's not. It's not life circumstance. It's signs to get back on the right path. Well, I probably had tons of those signs during that time period, but it was the one that basically said, you are not moving, your body is not recovering, and your heartbeat is going at 180 beats per minute while you're sitting still to get me to listen. And I finally listened, and I began on another journey. Because when it shows up that way, you have to stop and you have to reevaluate. And it's a gift. It always is a gift. The only thing we have in life, in control of in life, the only thing we control is our perspective. So you can choose to look at everything as a wisdom and ability to grow, an opportunity to see life differently, or you can see it as a victim. I choose as everybody says, Grover's glass is always overflowing. I'd rather see my life that way. Because everything is an opportunity to learn and grow from. Everything, every roadblock, every obstacle, is the ability for you to look within and say, what am I supposed to be learning right now? Because when those opportunities present themselves, I see them as gifts. The power of your perspective changes your life instantly. Once you understand the power of your thoughts, and your perspective instantly puts you in the, in the driver's seat. You get to see your surroundings the way you want to see your surroundings. Health and wellness is not about the food that you eat and the exercise that you're doing every week. It's part of it. It's a small, small, small part of it. Health and wellness is how you see the world. Health and wellness is your perspective of the world. That's where it begins with. All those other things are tools in the toolbox. The what foods are best for you? The how many hours should I be working out a week? The what should I be drinking with my meals? All that stuff are little tools in the toolbox. But without the right mindset, that tool, those tools come out, we we'll use them for a little bit, and then they fall away, right? How many, times, how many of you have ever tried to diet before? Come on, I don't know one person who hasn't. <laughs> All of us have. Every single person has. It's like a lifestyle, a diet lifestyle. One month and I'm in and then I'm out. Usually it's January to about February. Then it's usually May and June. 
And then we got like the pre-holiday because we know that we're going to indulge during the holidays, right? There's three like core dieting times a year. We're all doing it. But we don't need to. That's the thing. Once you understand that health and wellness is about your mindset, your perspective, and how you see the world, everything else becomes easier. Those tools, instead of using the screwdriver as a hammer, you actually get to use it as a hammer. Because when you're giving people tools who don't know how to use the tools, they don't know that, that they control the tools, you're using the wrong tools half the time. And then they don't work, right? So they don't work, then you give up, then you're mad at yourself, and then you sabotage yourself again, right? These self-loving thoughts. Oh, I can never do this. Everybody else can. Why can't I do this? It's, I don't have enough willpower. Willpower is not the rule of the game at all. Willpower is part of the tools in the toolbox. But you don't even need to pick up willpower if you got your perspective in the right direction. If you're living your life with passion. Passion doesn't necessarily just mean your job. Passion means what are you doing outside of your job? A key part to being rejuvenated because we spend so much time at work. Work can't be everything for us. What are you doing outside of work? Are you doing things that you love? Are you doing hobbies? Are you putting yourself first ever? Because if you're not putting yourself first, then you're robbing everybody else that you think that you're helping. If you don't have energy to give, then you are irritable, frustrated, short-tempered, and not seeing things as clearly and happily as you can, right? I know, the other day I was out with my daughters, and I was starving. I was so hungry. How many of you have ever got to that point where you know your blood sugar's dropped? If you don't eat something, you're just going to, like, snap. How many of you have ever been there? Right. I was clearly there at the moment. And my daughters kept asking me questions, and it was like they're twins, so it's literally in stereo. And I'm like, girls, seriously, please no more questions until I eat, because I'm going to snap. I'm losing my patience because I don't feel right right now. But that's all things. It's, if we're not happy, that was a very obvious moment to me. A lot of times we're reacting because we don't even realize what we're doing. During that time period where my kidneys and my heart shut down and I had to take this other career path, I didn't know what it was going to be. So what I had to do is some major self-reflection. What am I good at? What do I like to do? And I came up with, well, I like to inspire people. I like to help people. I like to push people out of their comfort zone. But I don't remember a course in school. I don't know about you guys, but I wasn't taught anywhere in school about any of those things. How do you make money inspiring people? How do you make money helping people? They're not taught to us. How about the fact that your creativity is your unlimited capital? And I was creative, but no one ever told me that in school. As a matter of fact, they made me stay in the lines instead of out of the lines. So I began this journey and this path of finding what I was good at and living my life by those things. And to make a really long story short, I actually got to realize that my creativity, while I was told to draw on the lines, was my biggest business asset. I started to help other women that were my clients at the time who would always say to me, hey, Jen, you started a business right out of college. Please teach me how to do it. So I started helping them find their thing that made them passionate help them start their businesses or find the job that they wanted to have versus the one that they thought that they had to have. And I helped them find what they loved to, to do because a lot of times we don't ever ask ourselves, what do we like to do? We just kind of do it. We wake up, we go to work, we leave, we go, we go by everybody else's rules. But if you're not sprinkling in some of what you love to do, you're depleting yourself of energy and happiness for everybody else that you think that you're helping. Right? It's the opposite of what we think. I think we've got to help everybody, and then we go last. But if you do that, you're now drained, and you're not actually really helping people the way that you think that you are. And so I helped these people start their businesses or find the jobs, find their passion that they loved. And I began, a lot of those companies started taking off at QVC, as George mentioned. And I was surrounded by all these people who had all these amazing ideas, and they were coming to life and I was making them tons of money. And I was like, wait a second. 
I have an idea journal too. I, I've got ideas too. But you know why I wasn't doing those ideas? Because as much as people thought I was living outside of my comfort zone, I wasn't. I was playing it safe. My dad was in the Marines, drill sergeant in the Marines. Yes, I had a very disciplined life. And his belief was that that whole failure mantra, it's not an option, right? Not necessarily the best thing to teach a child. I get it as an adult. But as a child, guess what I did? Anything that I could do to preserve failure so that I wouldn't fail. So I played it safe. I did all the things that I was good at. I learned now at this stage of my life, failure is just part of the journey on the way to success. Because there is not one successful person that I know who has not failed tons of times. They're just the ones that keep getting up. They're the ones that keep persevering. They're the ones that have the perspective to see that as their opportunity of growth. Because somebody else is probably down on their knees at the same exact time thinking, should I get up right now? Should I give up right now? And they're the ones that say, you know what, I'm going to give this another chance. I'm going to go for it. But during that time period, I was watching all these amazing people with these ideas. And it elevates you. Surrounding yourself by people that are doing amazing things, that are positive, that are happy, that is how you become happy. They challenged me to see my own self-worth that I didn't even give myself credit for. I had an idea journal, seriously, this big. I just didn't believe in myself enough because no one taught me in school how to take an idea and put it onto QVC. It's not part of the curriculum. But I knew I had those ideas that could do that. And it doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur or if you work for a company. It doesn't matter. The rules are the same. The principles are the same. It's about stepping out of your comfort zone. It's about challenging yourself to a higher ability. So during that time period, I kept watching all these people doing all these cool things, and I realized they're just like me. Most of them were really good in school. Most of them liked to socialize. Most of them did things that maybe weren't the, seen as the scholar at that time period. But the thing is, they all had passion. They all had determination. They all had perseverance. There's always someone smarter. There's always someone faster. There's always someone stronger. There's always someone, someone more. But then there's always somebody that's right behind you that you can help. And those people helped me along the way. They helped me believe in myself. And guess what the most fulfilling thing you can do day in and day out to give you energy? Helping somebody else. Truly energizing. Think about it for a second. Think about the last time you helped somebody how you felt. Right? How many of you have ever felt good helping somebody else? I want to see hands. I want to make sure everyone's awake. I want some energy movement. <laughs> Again, energy does not come exactly from where you might think it is. This is all about energy management. Energy comes from other sources. And if you can identify those things that you get energized from, you can do them more. A simple gesture of helping somebody else and making somebody else feel better can energize you instantly. It can make you feel better about yourself more than the person that you helped. That's not why you should do it. But genuinely, it does. So during that time period, I really struggled with my fear of failure. And fear, by the way, is an energy drainer. Drainer. So you have, to, you have to identify the things that give you energy, and you have to identify the things that take away your energy. Fear is the most crippling drainer that exists because it keeps you in a place that you're not thriving. So my fear of failure... My fear of, of going out of the comfort zone to that level, because no one taught me how to do it, was crippling me. Because I wanted to do it. I really did. But I wasn't allowing myself out of my comfort zone. So I was sitting on my front porch, I kid you not, in a rocking chair, <laughs> reading um, Fast Company magazine. And I was reading about a company who had just launched three years prior to and it became $100 million in three years. And they had stolen my idea. 
It was in my idea journal. They stole one of my ideas and they made $100 million with it. And I sat there with this feeling at the pit of my stomach thinking they had the courage and I did not. I validated that my idea in my idea journal was a really good idea, right? But I validated in a way that I did not want to validate it at that moment. Because somebody else had it made $100 million with that idea that was in my idea journal. How many of you have had moments like that? Right? I don't know one person who hasn't, just like one person hasn't dieted at one point in their life. We all had moments like that. And I sat there and I realized that my fear of regret, that pit at the bottom of my stomach, my fear of regret was so much worse than my fear of failure. And it became my mantra. The mantra that set me free to live truly the life I was meant to live. To live with purpose that I was supposed to have and live with. Because once I got rid of those fears of failure, and I realized regret was worse, I actually got to live to my potential. Energized, happy, doing things that I never was taught to do. But I figured it out because I was inspired to. Inspiration is everywhere. Inspiration is everywhere around you. How do you guys think you feel when you're inspired? Energized, right? Another energy indicator. Passion, purpose, inspiration energizes you. That's why I said that you have to find outside of just what you're doing in work, you have to energize yourself outside of work. Because then you come into work and you're energized and inspired and you see things differently. You have different glasses on. Truly see things differently. There's like a layer of film that goes away. You're like, oh wow, yeah, I didn't realize these glasses were so good. Because you're seeing the world differently because you're energized and inspired and you have more passion and excitement and happiness which makes all the other tools in the toolbox a lot easier to use. So finding that inspiration. So once I did that, I had set myself free. I, I made that my mantra, by the way, day in and day out, because you have to reprogram your thoughts. You can't be like, oh yeah, that regret thing is so much worse than happiness, failure, all those things that held me back for 30 years up until that point. Once you face a fear, you are never the same person. Once you face a fear, you grow exponentially. Two years ago, uh, January 4th, I walked in to do a segment on the Today Show, uh, not the Today Show, at the 10 Show in Philly. And uh, there's a woman who many of you probably recognize or know. Her name is Luann Kahn. And she was an investigative reporter for NBC for like 20 some years. And she was in there in the green room, and I'm like, well, what are you, what are you doing? Like, breaking story? Like, why? Are you, what are you going to talk about today? She's like, you know, I just got really stagnant in my career, and I needed to do something to invigorate myself outside of work so that I could reinvigorate my passion. Like, when I started doing this stuff, I loved it. And now I don't love it anymore because I haven't taken care of myself. I've been taking care of everybody else. So I'm not going to make myself a priority. And so I started a project called One Year First. And every day I'm going to do something I never did before. And I'm going to videotape it and blog about it. And I looked at her and I'm like, Luann, January 4th next year, you're going to be such a different person, no one's even going to be able to recognize you. Your energy is going to be out of control. You are going to grow so much, no one's going to even be able to notice you. Notice you. I don't mean she's going to physically change in a way that no one's going to notice her. But you do. You do physically change. Your energy changes. So October that year, I had walked back into the green room to do another segment. And I hadn't watched the show since I'd been on it because I'm usually working at that time. And so I walk in, and there she is. And she came up to me before this, I, as I walked in before the show started, and she was like, Hey, Jen, it's so good to see you. Oh my God, I have so much to catch up with you on. I'm like, well, What are you doing? Do you, do you do like weekly segments on your blog? She's like, No, I'm hosting the show. She was hosting a lifestyle show. I don't know how many of you understand the dichotomy of going from investigative reporter to hosting of a lifestyle show. 
But she had transformed herself so much and got in tune with who she was so much that she, her entire identity changed. But the thing that changed the most about her, which goes back to when you face a fear, you're never the same person, she was glowing, radiating. She had lost weight, not trying, but because she was so happy, because she had fate let go of fears, because she increased inspiration and inspiring other people and doing things that she was excited and passionate about, she was glowing. She transformed herself. That 10 months transformed who she was. It's health and wellness. She had fought cancer, I believe it's three times. Breast cancer, I believe it's breast cancer once, colon cancer, something else. She had a rough road and overcame it every time. Mentally, she overcame it every time. But the, the point is, is when you face fears, that's where you grow. That's where excitement comes into your life. That's where you start to shed the weight. One of my good friends gave me an analogy for life that's amazing. A life is like a hot air balloon. And when you're starting at a point where you realize that your life is a hot air balloon, you might have all those sandbags out all around you. And it's not until you let go of them, aka fears, old mindsets, negative programming. When you let go of those sandbags, do you start to rise? So you take off four or five in the beginning, you start to go up and you're like, oh, it's, wow, it's a d very different view up here. Look how nice everything looks. I didn't know Delaware was, had so many cool things everywhere I look. And then you start to hover. Once you hover is when you have to get rid of some more of those sandbags, right? More weight. And then you grow again. And then you hover again. But life is always about that. It's always about getting to a certain place. And then once you hover is when you say, all right, I got to face a fear. I got to shed down a couple of pounds here. I've got to increase something in my life. Because it's all about increasing the enhancers and detoxing the drainers. Once I let go of that fear, I came up with my QVC idea. Six months after that. Because inspiration's everywhere, but if your glasses are filled with film, you're not seeing it. My inspiration came in the form of a dishwasher tray. My twins were newborns at the time. I had taken them to the grocery store right about the same time as the rocking chair on the front porch. We were in the grocery store, and I don't know if you guys know how heavy, many of you remember how heavy those car seats are. Well, I had two of them, and I had my stuff, and I put them down. I'm in the express line. And as I put them down, they both did me a tremendous favor of wailing, screaming, crying at the same exact time. You know, the one where, like, there's no sound that comes out at first, and then all of a sudden it's, like, so high-pitched. That's what they did. <laughs> and I began to panic because it was so loud. I'm in an express line. I can't find my credit card. I dump my bag out in front of the cashier. And I'm thinking to myself, seriously, as far as innovations come in our society, women accept a bucket for a handbag. It's literally a bucket. Like, we could stick a mop in it, put a line here in it, and it's a bucket. And no one's complaining about this? No one's saying anything about this? So my mom had a mantra, you're not allowed to complain about something unless you do something about it. You have to back it up with the action or you lose all rights and privileges to complain, which I do carry on in my household today. And I live by it. And I was so programmed that I walk away after I put the car seats in and I'm panicked and I feel awful and... And I'm thinking to myself, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. I don't know. I can't even draw. I can't even draw a stick person. How am I supposed to call myself a designer? How am I supposed to change a handbag? I don't know how to manufacture these products. I don't even know what the solution is. So I shelved that thought process. Six months later, I'm unloading my dishwasher. 10, 11 o'clock at night, sleep deprived massively at this point. I look down, I'm like, it's so cool how you can see the knives, forks, and spoons standing up straight. I don't have to look for them. I don't have to say, like, where are the forks? Where are the spoons? I know where they are because everything's standing up straight. Wait a second. That's how I want everything in my bag to be, standing up straight. So I literally took the dishwasher tray out of the dishwasher, brought it to my handbag, bucket, stuck it inside, 
got all my contents, stuffed them in there. Even that tiny lip liner we refuse to depart with because it's discontinued and you save it for the special occasions and I could see it. I'm like, this is it. This is what every woman wanted. And I took that dishwasher tray as my prototype everywhere and I was so excited and I was alive and I was vibrant and all the sleep deprivation went away until I started to talk to myself and talk myself out of every reason why I should not be able to be doing that. I can't draw. I didn't go to school. For, how am I going to call myself a designer? All those FIT students are going to be so mad at me. I can't call myself an inventor. I really wasn't good in math and science in a room full of really good math and science people I know. How would I do this? I don't even know how to do it. And I talked myself down on so many occasions. Thank goodness that my determination and the excitement of my friends carried me along the way. Because accountability is critical, right? If you're going to work out, start a new workout routine. Anything that you do, accountability, a buddy system, is so important. Luckily, I showed it to a couple of my girlfriends who I really respected. And I respected their opinion. And they looked at me when I first showed it to them, and they looked and said, come on, someone's had a thought of that. Or, I wish I thought of that. The two statements, the post-it note theory, right? Winning product. So they would check in with me, hey, how's that bag thing coming along? Now I told them that that's what I was going to do. So they held me accountable. There were many times where I was like, well, I don't know, I keep running into all these roadblocks and all these problems and... And having an accountability system is what got me through it. Because I'll tell you what, when I started that journey and I got past my own self-limiting beliefs, I started to encounter everybody in the outside world's beliefs. So if you can't get it over your own inner roadblocks, there's not a chance you're going to get past the outer roadblocks. There's no way. If you don't have the confidence and conviction in yourself, there's no way you're going to get over the outer roadblocks. I pitched it to all the different people who had 10, 20, 30 years experience in the industry. Every single one said, mm, women only want fashion, they don't want function. They don't care about function. I'm like, well, I'm a woman and I do and my friends are and they do too. But I believe them. It's, we already tried that, it didn't work. How many of you have ever heard that? Execution. My execution was different. My approach was different. My story was different. Everyone was different. Every time a new idea or an idea that was already tried, it's a different time. Today is different than yesterday. Your audience is always different. After many, many no's, and I continued on my journey, it became one of the fastest growing handbag brands in history. Thank goodness I didn't listen to any of those people. But it became the springboard of so many things that I'm doing today. And in that springboard of so many things today, and all the hats I'm wearing, and all the businesses that I'm doing, and it's funny, my daughters started talking about in school, like what your parents do, and I hear them outside of my bedroom door, and they're like, no, she makes burnt bags, and the other one's going, no, she's on TV, and she writes books, and I walk outside, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? They're like, well, we were talking about what you did in school today, and she said that, and I said this, and I'm like, all right, girls, just you, it's okay, like, I do do all those things. You can just tell them that I'm a serial entrepreneur, and the one looks at me, and she goes, what cereal did you make? <laughs> I realized. She took it literally like a cereal entrepreneur. But the point is, is that I have to, just like every single one of us, we have to have energy. I can't go work all day and come home and be depleted for them. That's not fair. That's not right. But I can't be full on for them and depleted at work, right? Because people rely on me. So I, it, a switch went off for me. A couple years ago, when I was trying to do all these things and I was getting drained and I was exhausted and I had no mental clarity whatsoever. During my time in the fitness industry, I had followed all the mainstream media messaging about diet and, and fitness and nutrition. And most of them, I believe, are garbage. Most of them are a scarcity mindset. Most of them make us 
have a cycle of failure. Most of them are not at all why we do what we do. So we believe, oh, we gotta, gotta go on a diet. Diet means scarcity, right? What about abundance? What about if we think about life and wellness in the sense of abundance, energy management, as I said earlier? And it hit me. Because during that time period, I was depriving myself constantly. I literally lived on egg whites, oatmeal, chicken, salad, and yams. Pretty much in that order. Oh, and shakes. Nutrition shakes, protein shakes. And that was about it, day in and day out. Birthday cake icing was my kryptonite. And I wanted birthday cake icing about 23 of 24 hours because I couldn't have it. And I craved it all the time. And then when I would have it on my cheat Sunday, I would feel awful <laughs> afterwards. And at that time, I thought it was psychological, but it was actually physiological. But it still was the thing that I wanted all the time, even though I knew I felt awful. Because it was the thing I couldn't have. Right? It's like forbidden fruit. Right? If you can't have something, then you want it all the time. So I realized one day after having birthday cake icing and feeling awful and exhausted, and it was, I think it was a, something social, like my daughter's party at school or something, and I had to go back to work. And I remember just thinking, like, I'm so tired, I could take a nap right now. I don't even know how I'm going to get through the afternoon. I can't even think straight. And it hit me, how I felt at that moment was not productive. It was not how I wanted to feel. I wanted to feel energized and excited and filled with abundance of energy for the rest of the day. And so I started to take mental snapshots of every, sing every single thing I ate 20 minutes after I ate it. And I would gauge my energy. How do I feel after I ate that? I feel good. I don't feel so good. I feel exhausted. All the feelings, I would journal them. So I started to create a relationship with what I ate and how I felt. And it changed everything for me. Because it didn't go from I can't have that because I'm not allowed to because too many calories and too many fats and too many sugars to I don't have time for that. I can have it when I want, but I don't have time for it right now. I don't have time for it to make me tired. I love pasta. I eat pasta. I just eat it on the opposite of what everybody tells you to, that you're supposed to eat it. I eat it when the Europeans eat it, before bed. Because that is what's going to make me do. <laughs> it's going to make me tired. I eat it before bed. So I started to identify the superfoods for me. And it's different for all of us, by the way. We all have a different makeup. I don't need to tell any of you about this here. We all have our own things that work for us and don't based on your genetic makeup and your blood type. For me, I identified the superfoods that worked for me. The foods I go to, that I keep around me all the time, that give me tons of energy. And once again, it's the opposite of what you're told. It's avocados, guacamole specifically, hummus, nuts, cheese, bananas. Those are my go-to foods. But the thing is, you don't have to eat a lot of them because they're so nutrient dense and they have such great fats in them. They're superfoods. By the way, there's some superfoods in the outside when you came in, I don't know if you noticed them, that we supplied for you today so you can taste how awesome these superfoods super are. New York Life is here with us today because they're into being financially fit. So they're supporting and they help sponsor all of these superfoods out there that I want you to try. The hummus, amazing. Bobby's hummus. How many of you have ever heard of Bobby's hummus? Amazing. <laughs> One time I got a tub, a tub of it. Literally, it's a tub. <laughs> and it was a black bean hummus. And I'm eating it, and I'm like, I can't stop eating it. It's so good. And my daughter looks at me. She's like, is it, is it good for you still if you eat the whole tub, Mommy? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> it wasn't intended for that. But I can't stop eating it because it's so good. But... Identify
find those foods, and once you identify what they are and how they give you energy, naturally the other stuff falls off. I was in California about a year ago, um, and I had flown out that morning. I landed, I went to meetings. I hadn't eaten in almost 24 hours. I had a meeting at, a, um, it was like a bakery diner. And my friend Sheila, you know, you finally have like a lunch with a friend, so your guard comes down, and then you realize how hungry you are. So I come in with Sheila, and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at those cupcakes. <laughs> look how good those cupcakes look. But at that point, I'd already come up with this formula. But anything looks good at that moment. But those cupcakes looked especially good. So we sit down, we eat. I get soup. Soup, by the way, is another super food for me. Soup, usually, because it's broken down, so it's easier to digest. Therefore, it doesn't take up so much energy. So I had soup and salad. And afterwards, the waitress came back, and she was like, do you want, do you want anything else? Oh, didn't you want those cupcakes she said to me? I'm like, no, are you crazy? I don't have time for that. It'll make me exhausted. And the waitress in L.A. starts cracking up. She's like, I've never heard anyone say that before. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, it's usually like, oh, no, I can't eat that. I've been getting so much weight. She's like, I've never heard anyone say it's going to make me exhausted. I'm like, but it is. It makes me exhausted. That's why I don't want it. But identifying those things that give you energy, those foods, the other stuff falls off the wayside because you look at them and you're like, I don't have time for it. And that, for me, changed everything. Because my mental clarity started skyrocketing. I didn't have to work out nearly as much. I didn't have to work out as much. Because I was eating nutrient-dense foods that didn't make me have to work out so much. And I'm not taking away from working out. Working out is important because there's other benefits that come from it. Get your endorphins going. Bone density. Those are all important things. But I didn't beat myself up in working out anymore. Because that's the negative thought process. It's like, hey, die, 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 now beat yourself up, beat yourself up. If you think about it, it's pretty abusive when you think about it that way, right? Instead, I started to work out in a lifestyle way. So all these things that we're supposed to be doing, and I was a trainer, so I know how much I abuse some of my clients. <laughs> but I learned that if someone doesn't like it, they're not going to do it. Find the things that you like to do. Do different things. Maybe you run one day a week. Maybe you do yoga one day a week. Maybe then you lift one day a week. Maybe then you rock climb at one day a week. So then it's fun. Because then there's six days in between it. And so it's new and exciting. Find the things that you love and then do them. Yoga is so good for you. So good for you. Because it's a detoxer too. It's not just exercise. It's a detoxer. It took me about 12 years, by the way, 12 years until just last year to realize how important meditation is. Not to realize how important it was. I knew how important it was. For me to quiet my mind, or the thought I had to quiet my mind, I would sit there and I'd be like, I can't stop thinking. I can't do this. And I said to all these people, and they are so quiet and serene, and I can't do it. I can't meditate. Meditation is not about that. It is about quieting your mind, yes. But I seriously thought that dude, everyone I'm looking at, they're not thinking anything right now. How are they not thinking about anything? So I started guided meditations. How many of you are stressed out? Really? Come on, you guys. You're, is everyone's bosses in here? <laughs> everyone's stressed out. Everyone's got stress. There's, there's intrinsic stressors and there are extrinsic stressors. I just saw a documentary with before and after pictures of a 30-day meditation challenge. And what people's faces looked like before and after of only 30 days of meditation. Not 30 full days of meditation. 30 days of 20 minutes of meditation. <laughs> 30 days of meditation would be like a total transformation. 20 minutes a day. I didn't have time for it. I was like, I don't have time. I, did, did anyone see my to-do list? I don't have time for meditation. And then I started to realize when I did take that 20 minutes, everything I did was more productive, more thought out. I was more calm. I was more strategic. I could see and think more clearly. And it actually made me more productive to stop for that 20, 30 minutes 
made me accomplish more. It took a long time to figure that out. But in that figuring that out, I definitely encourage every single person to figure it out too. Because it is a transformational habit to encourage your lifestyle to change. I did um, Deepak Chopra's 21-day challenge, all these guided meditations. And if you haven't done it, you can go to the website and sign up for it. Another one's coming, but it, it, they, they do them every couple, every six weeks or something. And if you're looking a good way to get started or create a new habit, 21 days is how you do it, right? But this is a great, amazing one to do. And, and it, it's a social thing. So you'll see a lot of people on Facebook doing it and Twitter are doing it. So you have like a buddy accountability system, right? So one of my good friends who is way more dedicated in her meditation, who calls me to remind me about how important it is to me. <laughs> That's a good buddy to have. She did it with me. And so in doing it with me, she would always check in. Like, hey, did you like that one today? And she tricked me. I love how they did that one today about food. I thought that was really good about food. I'm like, are you tricking me? They didn't do it about food today. She was tricking me. But it, it is a powerful thing that's so important. And even if it's just, you're doing a 10-minute walk or a 20-minute walk and you're incorporating your meditation outside while doing it, it changes your life. It takes your stress down. It elevates your endorphins. Stress is a killer, right? Stress isn't something we should really think, oh, everybody's stressed. Everyone is stressed. But you can manage that stress. Stress your mind and your body don't separate. I know a lot of people think that they do, but they don't. So if you're thinking stressful, negative thoughts, guess what's happening to your cells and in your body? You're aging yourself. Aging yourself. Have, that, have any of you ever saw someone who went through a tough time in a short period of time and they instantly looked older? Within like even two or three months, they look older? That's stress. That's how damaging stress is. So maybe if yours isn't at the level that that person's was, it's still what it does over a period of time. I believe age is a mindset. I always say I'm on the happiness regime. That's my regime, my anti-aging regime. It's called happiness. The happier you are, the less you age. Or the slow, more slowly you age, I should say. The more positive your thoughts, the better your vibrancy of your skin and your hair. Truly. And so while it comes back to, for everybody, the diet and the exercise, I want you to all walk away and understand something today. And that's just a small part of the tools in the toolbox. It's your mindset. It's your perspective. It's everything that you do. When I say detox the drainers, I'm not just talking about the food that drains you. I'm talking about the people. And yes, there are family members we can't escape. I understand that. You limit your time and expectations with those people. Have no expectations. Detoxing the drainers. What I do when, I'm go when I go through a tough time, a stressful time period, to jumpstart detoxing the drainers, detoxing things in my life that are no longer working for me. Habits, people. I do a juice fast for a couple days. Because what it does is it detoxes your body, but it instantly changes your life patterns and behaviors. And when it instantly changes your life patterns and behaviors, you start to become aware of the patterns and behaviors that you had that you didn't even know that you had. And by the way, I get more nutrients in that way. Most of us do. That's where the juice, that's what? Juice for three days? Are you kidding me? You must be starving. That's not good for you. Really? It's not because I get a lot more nutrients that way, most of us do. Most of us eat, but we don't have nutrients in our food because they're all damaged and they're processed. If you take raw organic vegetables and you juice them, there's a heck of a lot more nutrients in there. My skin changes. It literally glows after three days. Glows. Save a lot of money on skincare products. But detoxing the drainers are also things that we don't even realize. I'm on the news. Guess what I don't watch? The news. I don't watch the news. Because I feel awful after I watch the news. I'm not ignorant. I know what's going on in the world. 
But I take my news, and now I can, especially with as much as social media has changed the game, but I take my news in doses that I can, the way that I want to. Not listening to the same thing over and over and over again, and the doom and gloom, and filling airtime, basically filling airtime of negativity. And when I go on the news, guess what I try and do? Make what I'm talking about really positive. Give a positive perspective. Give a productive perspective. Give a solution to a problem. Not make the problem worse by saying, oh, these bad things are going to happen. And increase the enhancers. By the way, music even. Music. Think about the music that you listen to. Subconsciously, everything's coming at you. So if you just went through a breakup, you should listen to sad music. <laughs> right? You should listen to things constantly that invigorate you. TV that invigorates you. Read things. I read Positively Positive every single morning. First thing, that's my coffee. I do love coffee, by the way, but that's my coffee. My positivity. To get me started with the right mindset in the morning. Find those things. Those outlets. There's another one called The Daily Love. I love the writers. They're amazing. And they're giving productive solutions and mindsets for your day. Find the people that invigorate you. Make them your go-to people on the list. Even if they don't know that they're the go-to people. The people that if you start complaining, they're like, uh-uh, uh no, I'm not letting you get away with this. Turn it around. The people that pick you up. The people that elevate you. Eradicating the negative Nancys. And increasing the positive polys. <laughs> I get called that a couple times. It's okay. Increasing the enhancers allows you to t identify and become aware how good it feels to feel good. And when you're identifying how good it feels to feel good, you start to quickly identify the things that make you not feel good. And those are the things that keep have to go away. You have to eradicate them. Women especially, we feel responsible for everyone that we've been friends with since we were five years old. Right? <laughs> I can't, if I, don't call, if I don't call her back, I don't, I don't, she's going to be so mad at me. If it's your friend, she's not. Because she's going to understand that you have a life, too. Ask Colleen, right? <laughs> Might be days. She'll keep texting me. Please, just call me back. I have things to tell you. You can find the people that support your goals and ambitions. And those friends aren't going to say, you do not call me back within 24 hours. Those people are people that have expectations of you that you probably did not set. And expectations are the things that sabotage our energy and relationships. So evaluate those things. And maybe set new expectations to people around you. Create boundaries. Let people know what your goals and ambitions are so that they understand what you're trying to accomplish for yourself. And if they're not in alignment with it, they'll quickly fall away too, or they'll try and sabotage it. So it's your choice to allow that or not. As we go forward from today, I truly encourage each and every one of you to see the possibilities in everything around you, to see every obstacle as an opportunity, to see every roadblock as a moment to step back and be like, what do I need to change? And see energy as your management system of health. Because all you have to do to know if you're doing the right things for your body is see how you feel. Sleep is really important, by the way. I didn't touch on sleep because I know most people talk about sleep all the time. But back when I got ill, it was because I wasn't sleeping. My body wasn't recovering. I was sleeping five hours a night, and I thought that, oh, I'm a superwoman. I got a badge of honor for that five hours, right? It's not good. Your body needs to restore. Everyone's got a different gauge between six and eight hours, but sleep is an important thing. So if you're well-rested, in those times that you're awake and you're still feeling drained, start to evaluate the things around you and start to detox the drainers and increase the hancers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Very inspiring. Does anyone have any questions?
<laughs> no? Okay, so real quick, uh, we had a, a raffle drawing, so I want to draw some names for the raffle. And then before we leave, there's all that superfood out in the auditorium lobby. So what, what is the first prize? The first prize will be a $50 Visa card, okay. compliments of New York life. Okay. Do you want me to pick? Yeah. Reach down. All right, first prize goes to Melissa Mercier. Another one. Oh. Pick me. <laughs> Matthew Harmon. Congratulations. Okay, the next prize? We're going to do um, Jen's book. One of Jen's books? Autograph. Autograph. Albert Liu. Another book? <laughs> Another <Yeah>. book. <laughs> Another book? Okay. Oh, that's great. The back half it wasn't stapled. <laughs> Is that the front uh, half? That might be the front half. Okay. Hopefully. Caitlin Latchaw. <laughs> we have three books? Yeah. Okay. Jessica Kohlhofer. Kuhn Wang. Oh. Right, <laughs> Very nice. Okay. All right. I'd like to thank Jen again and Colleen Corvino and, and New York Life for sponsoring us today. Everyone have a great day. Do it this time, yeah. uh, Jen will sign books out in the uh, lobby, too. <laughs>